Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, New York City is considering new regulations after its largest ever outbreak of Legionnaire's disease. In the last four weeks, it's infected at least 100 people. Ten of them have died. Here's John with more. 31-year-old New York City cab driver Daniel Tejada was released from the hospital four days ago after nearly a month fighting the potentially deadly form of pneumonia known as Legionnaire's. Why did you go to the hospital? Well, I went to the hospital because I couldn't take it anymore. I lasted four days in bed with fever, chills. Hundreds turned up in the Bronx for a packed town hall meeting to express their fears over how the disease spreads. Legionnaires is most commonly caused by inhalation of mist or vapor containing the bacteria. Fewer than 5% of people exposed to it will develop the disease. It is not spread person to person. But people are still anxious about the city's handling of the situation. But I am concerned of the source of where is it coming from and how it's contaminating so many people. Do you have a sense that they have it under control? Not really. <laughs> no, not really. City officials have linked the Legionella bacteria to five water cooling towers, which are outdoor units used for air conditioning in large buildings. Bronx Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson is pushing for improved regulation of those towers. The outbreak has drawn scrutiny of public health oversight here in New York City's poorest borough. Why do you think it is concentrated here? I think when you look at communities like mine in the South Bronx, where you have many residents who do not have a form of primary care, many of these reported cases are individuals that have severe health problems already. So, John, what's the latest now? Well, the CDC has actually sent a team of investigators here to New York City to figure out what exactly is going on. In the Bronx, they have cleaned those five cooling towers, and they're warning people, especially the elderly or the people with underlying uh, immune problems or medical conditions, to be especially on the lookout if you have a flu-like symptom, if you have fever, cough, get help right away, because this is treatable with antibiotics. A new government effort aims to slow the spread of antibiotic-resistant superbugs. The CDC says the new approach against these deadly bacteria could help prevent 619,000 infections and save 37,000 lives over the next five years. So what is the CDC recommending? All right. Well, Vanita, this is actually a really interesting report. The CDC used this elaborate mathematical model to figure out how many people would have infections and death related to superbugs over the next five years. But then they took it a step further. And and figured out how just a couple of simple steps could cut down on those infections by 70%. And really the approach hinges on two things. The first is better reporting and tracking of superbug infections. Mm -hmm. But the second, which is most important, really has to do with communication between healthcare facilities as well as local and state uh, health organizations. So for instance, right now a person might be admitted to the hospital, exposed to a superbug, and then after their hospitalization they're transferred to a rehab facility or a nursing home or even a hospice care center where they're exposing others all, all along the way. Right. If we can improve communication between these centers, we can cut down on all of that exposure. So it's, it really makes sense. John, the CDC also said that doctors need to be careful about over-prescribing <clears throat> uh, yeah. antibiotics. Why is this so important? We've heard about this over and over again. Yeah. It's, it's overuse of antibiotics, not just uh, medically, but also in the farming community where it's overused. We, we say this over and over again, if you have a cold, for example, caused by a virus, don't be pushing your, your doctor to give you antibiotics. That's not going to really do any help. Um, just tough it out, do conservative care, because what happens is the bugs get used to it and they, they mutate and then they become, they become resistant. So it's very important not to overuse antibiotics. All right. New research might make your next running shoe purchase a little easier. Orthopedists, coaches, and runners said for years that we should buy shoes based on factors like pronation, how much the foot rolls inwards as it lands, and impact force. Now the University of Calgary researchers find that shoe selection based on comfort alone might be the best way to help prevent injuries and enhance performance. I Simple as that. I absolutely <laughs> love this study. I love this type of study that just follows logic and makes sense. You know, really, I, I took this to mean our bodies are actually really, really good judges of how we should move and how we should run. Mm -hmm. If you try and fight with it too much or ignore what your body's telling you, like wearing uncomfortable shoes, you're raising your risk of injury. I'm so going to take these it's, off it's right brilliant, now. <laughs> it's brilliance and simplicity, how, right? How many times has a salesperson said, you, you'll break it in when you get home right. and it'll feel better. Yeah. If, it doesn't feel, if it doesn't fit in the store, it's not going to fit later. 
Well, if you plan to enjoy a cocktail in the summer this weekend, be careful with the lime. Mm. It could cause a skin reaction that some people call the other Lyme disease. Now everyone's listening. So right. what's what is going on with this? All right. So this was actually a medical mystery that happened to me. A young woman came into my office years ago, and she had this rash on her thigh. Mm -hmm. She had just been on vacation in the sun, and she said other doctors had said it was herpes or something else. It didn't look like herpes to me, but I really didn't know what it was. But I did notice that that the rash looked like it was in the shape of a hand. So. What I did was I took some pictures and I spoke to an absolutely brilliant dermatologist, Dr. Mark Grossman, showed him the pictures. He said, oh, this is probably uh, phytophotodermatitis. I said, what is that? <laughs> yeah. And he explained to me that what can happen is that exposure to lime or lemon and actually other things, celery, parsnips, parsley, right. can actually be the opposite of sunscreen. So it can photosensitize. So wherever you have this on your body, you get a sunburn. So he said, go back and ask her if she had some lime on her hand. So I called her up excitedly. I said, did you have any lime? She said, yes, yes, I was on vacation. I had a Diet Coke. I know I was squeezing some limes. So and it's then the I'm, juice. It's I'm, the juice, uh, the juice on their hand. I put my hand on my thigh. And then, of course, she got a sunburn right there. Mystery solved. Wow. All right, finally, chili pepper fans can rejoice. A new study suggests a diet with spicy foods can help you live a longer life. The research found people who ate spicy food one to two times a week had a 10% lower risk of death from heart disease, cancer, or diabetes than those who ate spicy food less than once a week. Yippee, right? Uh, even This is an observational study, so we can't take too, too much from it. But it's not the first to really focus on this active ingredient in chili peppers called capsaicin, which is supposed to be good for us. It, it, it cuts down on inflammation, anti-cancer, um, and is overall a good thing. So I, if you can tolerate it. One of the theories in the paper that was interesting to me was that it's somehow changed the gut microbiome, these trillions of bacteria in the gut, uh -huh. in a way that, that helped, uh, helped your overall health. Who knows? And who knows? We need more studies. Yeah. But at least we know it doesn't look like it hurts you. I yeah. know. Even if it hurts you. Yeah, I love to eat that. It hurts going down, but yeah. All right, Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thanks so much.